You know what? Who needs Brett Pesci when you got a guy like Jalen Chatfield, okay? We got to talk about a guy who could have been a top four defender on the Canucks. What? Are you serious, man? Anyways, it's Trevor Beggs. It's Kyle Bowen here on a bonus episode of Locked On Canucks. Your Locked On Canucks. Your daily podcast on the Vancouver Canucks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hey, we said we're going to only be here three days a week, and we lied, baby. So thanks for tuning in to this bonus episode of Locked On Canucks. My name is Trevor Beggs, Canucks writer and credentialed media member for Daily High Vancouver. And before we dive into this bonus episode, we want to thank you for listening to Locked On Canucks. It's your team every day. Make sure you subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, I hopped on here today to talk about something on my mind, which is Jalen Chatfield. I was expecting to do a solo episode, and I show up in the studio, and guess who's here, man? Guess who's in the lobby? Kyle Bowen. What's going on, buddy? Uh, not much, man. I, I genuinely felt like, uh, felt like talking hockey today, and I thought I would have to do it solo. And uh, here we are together, man. I think we're addicted to the Canucks together, and we're, tic- uh, we're I think we're more addicted to the, the, the people of Locked On Canucks, for real, for real, for real, doing a lot for us, doing a lot for our, our imaginations. Uh, we're living the dream, and it's because of them. Speaking of them, uh, we'll get to them. In what, eight minutes, seven minutes on Common Corner? For real, because we have to talk about Jalen Chatfield of the Carolina Hurricanes. And I think we're only talking about this because of this uh, of this want for Brett Pesci from some of us. And uh, uh, you read some interesting stuff, and then you shared that news. And you're toxic energy, man. Uh, the darkest <laughs> guy on the program, one of the most toxic people from the West Coast, the best coast in this hockey market, Trevor Beggs. Uh, take the floor and tell us more about uh, the former Vancouver Canuck, Jalen Chatfield. Yeah, so this, honestly, this article really caught my eye. So it was Corey Lavalette from The Athletic, and he was talking about, you know, why the Hurricanes are trying to trade Brett Pesci and not Brady Shea. And here's what he said. He said, for one, the Hurricanes have Chatfield, a right-handed defenseman like Pesci, to move into the top four. Okay, I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, what, Jalen Chatfield? Top four Chatfield? Are you kidding me? But here's the thing, you know, I, I, one of the reasons why this is such a fan, uh, fascinating topic for me is because people are really divided. There's a big group of Canucks fans I'm seeing right now who are like, we shouldn't have let him go. It was a mistake. You know, shout out to Daryl Keeping at Canucks Army. I know he was a big whisper on Chatfield. Really great fancy stats, don't exit stats at the time. But then there's another portion of the fan base who are saying like, oh, well, he probably wouldn't have succeeded if he was here and, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm actually going to pull up this comment from Reddit quick that I was reading earlier today. And, you know, someone was saying, you know, sucks that we lost Chatfield. This is back in 2021 when he signed with Carolina. The guy saying, sucks that we lost him, but he would have had a hard time leapfrogging our current right-handed defenseman. <laughs> Hamannick, Poolman, Shen, and Jet Wu. I got to ask you right now, is is Chatfield better than all of those guys? <laughs> well, dude, <laughs> Maybe you definitely... Maybe not with Shen, but I mean, Hamannick, Poolman, and Jet Wu? You, you I think you'd rather have Chatfield. I know. You, you definitely watched more Chatfield than I have. And I do remember watching him early on in his brief Canuck career. And I've seen a couple games with Carolina as well. And he just has that tenacity. He's a good skater. I'll say the word uh, I'll say the word again, tenacity. And just based on that one sentence that you did read, right? Like, oh, we can replace Brett Pesci with Chatfield in the top four. If somebody's writing that and uh, we're going to take that person's word, uh, there's probably a lot of hockey intelligence with Jalen Chatfield as well. On top of the uh, tenacity, on top of being able to skate well, uh, is he good at making a first pass? Uh, what are these underlining stats saying, Trevor Beggs? Is, is this all fluff? Or did we actually lose a legitimate top four defenseman in a good team? I, I think that's the main thing, too. Like, is Jalen Chatfield a top four D-man for, like, bad teams? Or does he have to be surrounded by a great structure and great players and a great team for him to flourish? Uh, uh, this is alarming. You know what this is really doing? This is scaring me uh, when it comes to uh, possibly acquiring uh, Brett Pesci, whether it be via trade or next season in the offseason. Yeah, I think that's like a, a another big takeaway here, too. It's like everyone's getting uh, all up in arms, but oh, got to get Brett Pesci on the team, trade a first round pick plus for him. And it's like this guy's about to replace, be replaced by Jalen Chatfield who's making $762,000 next season. And who knows? Again, this is, you know, one writer's opinion, albeit a very good uh, glued in writer for the athletic. Um, mm-hmm. You know, in terms of what I've seen from Chatfield, Again, he's a third pairing defenseman on good teams. People are like, oh, he won't succeed in a top four role. But to me, it's like a very similar situation to what Carson Susie's entering in Vancouver. Like we're talking about Carson Susie now three years, 3.25 million a season. 
pretty much only been a bottom pairing defender throughout his career. Now he's finally going to get the chance at age 29 to become a top four defenseman. So you're talking about Jalen Chatfield, who's 26, and he's going to get a chance potentially if one of these Carolina defensemen move to be a top four guy. And in terms of the fancy stats, you know, Carolina, again, everyone in Carolina has great possession stats. They're a great possession team. But Chatfield's one of the best possession players on that team and even in the NHL. Okay? You know, oh. with Shane Gosses Bear this season, they put over 150 minutes together. I think their expected goals for percentage is like 67%. I mean, it's through the roof. He's crushing his bottom pairing matchups. And who's to say he can't be a top four defenseman? I think, again, Daryl Keeping pointed out at the time, he's got some speed, he's got some tenacity, he's got the defensive awareness. I think what scared me about Chatfield at the time is he had pretty much zero offensive production in the AHL. Like when he came to Vancouver, he had like four assists in 48 AHL games. So I'm watching this guy and I'm like, you know, I think he might have what it takes, but is he going to score like zero points a season? Is he going to be like Tucker Pullman? Ironically, he got signed instead of Chatfield. So um, really proud of his development. And again, that same summer, I wanted to point out, you know, when Chatfield signed with Carolina, Here's who Vancouver signed uh, when they let Chatfield walk. Again, Chatfield walked as a Group 6 UFA. They brought in Brady Keeper. He had an unfortunate knee injury, but didn't work out. Brad Hunt, Luke Shen, Tucker Pullman, uh, Travis Hamannick re-signed. Uh, so, uh, again, is Chatfield better than any of those guys? Or all of those guys? Maybe not Luke Shen, but I'd say everyone else, probably. I forgot that we... Uh... We signed Travis Hamannick again, you know? I, I, f I forgot that we gave him that. It wasn't like a big deal, but it was still an overpayment. A am I correct? It was like a two-year, $6 million deal or something like that. What, what was it again? Yeah, yeah. No, it was, it was exactly it. It was three mil a season, two years, six million. Yeah, that was that was just way too much, and we all knew and, it. And not well. to mention, this organization let Chatfield walk and then signed Tucker Pullman. <laughs> Yo, what are we doing here, Begsy? It's Thursday. The sun is shining. You got a family out. Like, Come on, bro. We're, we're, we're going in the past and really digging up the facts and just hurting ourselves even more more but i think we have to do this to do our due diligence right because we were jumping into uh again the brett pesci party a couple months ago 40 days ago and man oh man again I, I, i'm scared i'm scared is it again better for a team that doesn't have a lot of assets um to just develop from within slash really look at this thing patiently and when i when i say that i mean uh this team this team in its window i know we need to take the next step next season but I feel as if to get to the ultimate step, this team can't be impatient. Uh, they can still build with a, with uh, from within while getting better, you know. And that's going to be uh, the turning point for the franchise. Like, how are they going to move after? Let, let's say they have a good next season. Let's say they make the playoffs. Let's say they take the next step. How quick are they going to turn that wheel? Are they going to act uh, again irrationally and maybe trade assets, trade first round picks again to immediately take uh, another step when? Maybe after one successful season, they can kind of put their eye slash pure vision on 2025, 2026 instead of maybe taking risks. Because this team needs to not only develop from within, they need to like actually stockpile assets as well so they can contend for longer than, you know, one and a half seasons. It's just the truth. They've done a lot of damage over the last 15 years when it comes to, again, getting assets and developing them. So, man, oh, man, I think. This is what the Jalen Chatfield slash Brett Pesci possibly becoming a Canuck thing has kind of led me to. Uh, I think the Canucks, even even though, again, uh, they have to win and they have to win now, they still have to be super patient. Super patient. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, I, I think bringing the Chatfield up is to kind of twofold. You know, first and foremost, kudos to the guy for, you know, going from depth AHL defenseman to possibly being a top four defenseman on a Stanley Cup contender. But the second thing is, you know, Canucks development really better figure things out under this different regime because Jim Benning, that regime, they 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 screwed the pooch in terms of uh, in Whoa. terms of developing and finding guys uh, on the open market. So yeah, lot, lots of mistakes there, and I think there's some you know signs of life under LVM, But let's let's wait and see. Let's not make another Jalen Chatfield mistake. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. And I think this all ties into uh, the person that we're going to talk about after the break. And that's Heronic. It's our it's our pregame before the main game, right? Let's talk about Heronic for a couple minutes before we get out of here, right? Bonus episode of Locked on Canucks. Comment corner is going to be used in the next segment to again bring up Heronic. But first, Trevor Beggs, you gotta you gotta shout out somebody, right? All right, Kyle. Comment corner on the other side. But first, you know, I gotta shout out FanDuel. Okay, take your first swing at betting MLB on FanDuel and get ten times your first bet amount in bonus bets up to two hundred dollars. That's right. Just bet 20 bucks, 
and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's $200 you can spend betting on everything from the money line to the over-under to who you think is going to hit the first home run. Hey, it's all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you get paid instantly. There's no better place to bet on MLB than FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So sign up today and visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. By the way, before we get back to the show, I got to remind you again that every episode of Locked on Canucks will be available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, your favorite podcatcher at 4.20 p.m. for no reason at all. Again, every episode of Locked on Canucks at 4.20 p.m. for no reason at all. Let's get back to the show. Okay, okay, you back. We back as well here on Locked on Canucks. Your team, every day, Trevor Beggs, Kyle Bowen. Uh, like I said, we're addicted. We're addicted to the people here, man, for real. We can't get enough, and we're supposed to take a day off today, you know, enjoy uh, the, f- the fruits of our labor, right? That's what they say. And uh, we're here talking Canucks, talking Brett Pesci, Jalen Chatfield. Those guys are not even Canucks. <laughs> and we're talking about them. Uh, but now we're going to talk about Philip Aronic. okay? Uh, let's do it. Let's run it. Comment Corner. Welcome to Comment Corner, powered by paraphrasing. First comment goes to a dude named Adam. Trevor and Kyle, stop being stupid coconuts. I had Cider on 17 fantasy teams, and he was hot garbage for like 50 games of the season and lost the PP1 spot to the 19th best D-man in the NHL, Philip Hironic, who excelled. He was so inspiring that I bought a signed Philip Hironic jersey, Okay. I started crying tears of joy when Vancouver landed such a quality defenseman and shocked that Iserman let him go for only a first and third round pick. <laughs> and they say Vancouver never wins. <laughs> Damn. Adam, bro. Okay, so uh, let, let's set the record straight. And Begsy, you're an honest guy. I know you. You're, you're the most honest guy, the most genuine guy. You know it in your heart that this guy watched more Philip Peronic than you did last season. You can tell. He had him on his fantasy team. And I, I just, like, I, I, I know he's just a commenter, a fan, right? We haven't seen him face-to-face. We don't know if this guy's the real Detroit insider on the West Coast, the best coast. But something in the writing tells me that, again, he's telling the truth. He's watched a lot of Hironic. How many games did you watch of Philip Hironic last year? That's a great question. Probably less than this guy, right? I probably watch a handful of Detroit Red Wings games. You know, they're, they're a good, like, early in the morning uh, okay, okay. game on the weekend. And, you know, I'm, I'm an early morning guy. But anyway, okay. I'll say this. Guess who else had Philip Hronick on his fantasy hockey team last oh! year? This guy. This guy. So, okay, so you so, yeah, watched so, him too. You, you, you can tell me. I know all about it. You know, I thought Hronick, he was a great late round steal for me. Um, and yeah, Mort Sider, again, they elevated him in the lineup after that Calder season. And, you know, even looking at the points, Sider had 42 points in 82 games. Hronick had 38 in 60 games. So yeah, Hronick outproduced Sider last season. But at the end of the day, it was still Hronick playing most of that uh, secondary matchups for the Detroit Red Wings. Like we know this guy can produce offense. That's not the problem. The problem is, is he actually a legitimate good shutdown defenseman? And he wasn't until last season. And again, that was in a secondary role. And again, something Sider struggled with a bit, but um, like I said, wait and see. I, at the end of the day, I just want the Kool-Aid Adams drinking. Okay. Let's say Hronix is steel. Eisman was dumb. Hronix going to be the best thing since sliced bread. Let's go, baby. Yeah, I know you want that. I know you want that. And it's funny because I tried calling you out. But then, again, sometimes I underestimate how much of a hockey nerd you are. Because you have so many things going on in your life. You're taking exam after exam after exam. The family's, you know, like you're actually doing real men, real, real human being stuff. And I'm like, yo, there's no way this guy's watching this much hockey. But then I realized that you're Trevor Beggs and you watch more hockey than anyone. So you did see a lot of Philip Aronik. And I think you keep mentioning the fact that he has to establish himself as a good two-way defender. And he has to do it again next season and the season after that, based on the fact that the Canucks gave up a premium. They gave up a premium. Like that's not an underestimate. It's an actual premium, not just for the Vancouver Canucks, but as far as player acquisition goes, that was a premium. So the expectations are high, and I think it's warranted. Uh, we need Philip Peronic to a get paid a lot of money and b be a legitimate number two defenseman for this team and for this te- uh, for and doing so for a very long time. Yeah, 100%. And I, I certainly hope it happens. But I, I mean, I'm skeptical, you know, 
Yeah. Again, one good season defensively, and no credit to Adam Ronick was really good last season. But there's also you know three seasons before that where he was overmatched and got shelled at even strength. So let's just hope that uh, Ronick's developed and that he's the real deal next year. Hey, speaking of hope, okay, before we get out of here, have to do it, okay? Hope is dope. The T-shirt not available now, but the hope is dope. The T-shirt, it's coming out. It's coming out. It has to come out. And A, it has to come out because hope is actually dope. We need the city to be hopeful about their hockey team again. And I know patience is important. And we brought up the fact how, you know, they can't rush into things. They have to take each step before they get back to being a contender and being in the race to dance every year. They got to be back to being a legitimate hockey team. Uh, That being said, I think it is really important for this team to start winning next year so we can be hopeful that the cup will one day come to Vancouver again because not to get negative. But it's the truth. I, I, if the Canucks don't win next season, like win hockey games and play meaningful games and give us that, that feeling in our stomach again next season, as soon as next season, then it's bleak. Then it's really bleak. It's the truth. Then it's dark. You think you, you've seen dark? No, it's going to get dark next season if this team does not win and win right away. That being said, hope is dope, and I want hope to be back in all our hearts when it comes to this version of the Vancouver Canucks. You know, I, again, I want us to be angry about how the team played hockey games, a uh, game in and game out, not assuming things, not going back and forth, not talking about management, not getting mad about assistant general managers, blah, blah, blah. Let's just talk about hockey games next season. And that can happen if we win games. Uh, man, oh man, locked on Canucks, your team every day. Uh, Begsy didn't expect to see you, but you're here. I'm here. Uh, sign us out, okay? One love. Uh, that, that was beautiful time, buddy. Great to see you on here. We both expect him to go solo, and uh, now my wife thinks I love you more than I love her. So, uh, <laughs> you know, thanks for making that happen. Oh man! And, uh, shout out to the Hope is Dope shirt too. I'd wear it in a tank top too. Oh man, I'm ex- I'm excited to see those drop. Okay. Let's go, baby! But for now, shout out to the everydayers, the occasional listeners. If this is your first time listening, oh, you tuned in to bonus time. Oh, you, you got an extra special bonus spot in my heart. Um, coming up on tomorrow's show, we are back with the full show. We are going to talk about that guy, okay, Phil Bronick. Is he the most important player on the Canucks next season? Find out tomorrow. But for now, I'm Trevor Beggs. That guy's Kyle Bowen. And you've been listening to Locked On Canucks. Peace.